Yeah. Praise the Lord. I could think of only one song to open up with this morning. Got a bunch of verses, but I'll feed them to you. There's a fountain open in the house of God. Been a dry spell. Thank God for the, 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 the coming over the, you know, oh, I'll say it in a minute, the live stream. But it's just different to be here. Praise the Lord. So, if in your mind you'll turn to page 293 and stand and sing with all your heart, there's a fountain open in the house of God where the vilest of sinners may go. All test the power of the crimson blood that and the blood that washes whiter than snow. Sing the song. There's a fountain opened in the house of God where the vilest of sinners all test the power. Test the power of the crimson of the blood. But that makes whiter than snow. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'm watching. In the all-cleansing blood of the Lamb And my robes are whiter than the driven snow I am washed in the blood of When that fount was opened When that fount was opened in the Savior How the thief did rejoice And when dying Lord, remember me Prayed, oh, the blood washed his sins all away. Praise the Lord. I am washed in the all-cleansing blood of the Lamb. And my robes are whiter than the driven snow. I am washed in the blood of... Will you come and reason? Will you come and reason saith the Lord with me though your sins to me glow and if dyed with scarlet stain I will make it as white as the snow praise the Lord oh I am washed in the all cleansing blood of the Lamb and my robes are whiter than the driven snow. I am washed in the blood of the land. Let her play. I have overcome now. Well, if that's the next verse coming up, go ahead. I have overcome. Now. I have overcome now by the blood of the Lamb, and I'm clothed in my raiment so white, and I'm on my journey. Ever. 
water. Praise the Lord. I am washed in the all-cleansing blood of the Lamb. And my robes are whiter than the driven snow. Oh, the in the blood. What are these in spotless robes? What are these in spotless robes? And whence came? As they're singing with palms in their hands. These through tribulation. the victim. Having washed. Having washed in the blood of the Lamb. Praise the Lord. I am washed. In the all-cleansing blood of the Lamb. And my robes are whiter than the driven snow. I am washed in the blood of the Lamb. Amen. It was so good to hear the singing live again. <laughs> Amen. And you know what? It didn't make any difference whether you were off key or on key. It's just good to be back in the Amen. house of God. I want to welcome everyone and welcome everyone that's joining us via live stream. <clears throat> we want to go to the Lord in prayer. We want to continue to remember Sister Betty Bounds. Last time I talked with her, she was doing better. But I know that um, she's doing well to, to stay at home. We also uh, want to remember Sister Lewis. She goes back into the hospital uh, on Wednesday. They're going to run further tests, find out whether or not her leukemia is uh, growing or it's stabilized. Also, we want to remember Brother Jay Crouch in, in prayer. We want to remember Sister Kohler. Does anybody know? I knew that she had her surgery scheduled, but does anybody know whether she had her surgery? She hasn't had it, but it's coming up, my understanding is, right? She got off when? Oh, okay. All right, good, good. Want to remember Sister Kohler. She's long overdue for that surgery. She's been in a lot of discomfort. Also, we want to continue to remember Sister Pettit, Sister Wright. They're both going through dialysis. And then we want to remember uh, Sister Foreman's daughter, Jenny, her boyfriend Jerry Henderson uh, has a 26 year old daughter who lives in uh, Erie North Carolina and uh, she had just went through a divorce was dating another man and that man murdered her uh, shot her in the head with a shotgun took her out in the backyard on his farm and buried her very very deep with a track hoe and they've caught him and uh, it has broke Jerry's heart. Jerry was here just not too long ago celebrating Sister Foreman's uh, birthday. <clears throat> and uh, he came up to me after the church, after the service. And uh, he said, Brother Tony here, I want to give you something for the rental of the, of the dining hall. I said, well, you don't have to. But nevertheless, he gave us a generous offering. And uh, just a wonderful guy. And now he is driven down with his family. And uh, I don't know whether, well, she, they've already buried. I think they've already buried her. He buried her. They wanted to see him. The police said, no, you don't want to dig her up and see her. You don't want to have those memories on your mind. So anyway, pray for that situation. Uh, also, we want to remember the families who lost loved ones during the coronavirus. It's... Uh, it's a tragedy what's going on. Many, many heartbroken. Those people in the rest homes, those people in hospitals who died and their loved ones weren't even able to come in and hold their hand or say their finals goodbyes. Um, it's been a very difficult two months for uh, this country. Also, we have uh, unspoken requests that we'd like to uh, ask you to remember. I'll take your burdens by an upraised hand. And also, happy Mother's Day. So glad that we're able to have a live Mother's Day service. Brother Bob's going to come and lead us in prayer. Uh, 
our gracious Heavenly Father. We want to thank you one more time, God, that we have the privilege to come into this house of worship. We thank you, God, that you've begun to open up the way, Father, where people, Lord God, can come together and be able to worship and honor you, God, one more time, to lift your name, God. Oh, Father, that souls might be saved, that souls might be aware, Lord. Father, that thou art still on the throne. We thank you, God, for each and every one that's gathered here this morning, Lord. We ask your special blessing upon them, God. We pray, Heavenly Father, you'll bless each home that's represented, God. And then, Lord, you'll look upon those homes, Father, that would like to be here. We pray, God, you'll help them, each one. And, Father, we bring before you this morning these many requests, Lord. Father, you heard each one. You know, God, those places where the, the sick and afflicted lay, not able to be here, God. We pray in Jesus' name, you'll look upon them, Father. We ask of you, God, you'll be with those homes where death has entered. Only you understand, God, the needs of each one. We pray, Father, that you'll look upon them, God. Lord, we pray that you'll help us each one to be more aware, Father, of your goodness and your mercies and your kindness, Father. Lord, we pray that your divine hand would move upon our nation, God, and awaken our people, Lord, to the spiritual things. Lord, of people might be awakened to the condition of their soul, Lord. Father, that people might seek your face, God, that, Lord, your name can be glorified and lifted up, God. We ask you, Father, concerning all of our, all of this virus that's going around, we pray, God, that you'll protect your people, Lord. Take care of each one of them, Father. Keep them, Lord, we pray. We know, God, you're able to move upon each and every one of your children, Lord, and to protect them from this terrible virus. We ask of you, God, that your mercies be upon our nation, Father. Be with our president today, God. Help him. Lord, help all the leaders, Lord God, of our nation. We ask you, Jesus, that you'll deal with their hearts, Father. And may they serve, Lord, uh, O oh God, even in your eyes, Father. May they realize, Father, that you are overlooking them. We pray, Father, today that you'll bless this service this morning. Bless everything, God, that's said and done here, Father. May our privilege, Lord, be blessed of you this morning to come together to worship thee. And God, anoint Brother Tony this morning as he preaches the gospel, Father. Open our ears and our minds and our hearts, Lord. May we learn, Father, from the things that you want to tell us, Lord. God, help us, we pray, that our lives can be blessed, Lord, of you, Heavenly Father, and we can be more instrumental, Father, in your service. Continue to guide our nation. Continue to help us, Father, to get through this crisis. Lord, we'll give your worthy and holy name, Father, the praise and the honor and the glory for all that you do for us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. While we don't take our morning tithes and offerings, we're going to say, blessed be the name of the Lord. And by the way, the, the, the pot's back there. Put your money in that as you go out, and it'll work out fine. All right. All praise to him who reigns above in majesty supreme. That's good. Who gave his son for me to die. That he might man redeem. Praise the Lord. Sing the song. All praise to him who reigns above 
in majesty supreme who gave his son who gave his son for man to die that he might man redeem <laughs> Blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. His name above all names shall stand, exalted more and more. Father's own right hand, whom angels hosts adore. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Redeemer, Savior, Redeemer, Savior, friend of once ruined by the fall. Thou hast devised salvation's plan, for thou hast died for all. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. His name shall be the Counselor, the mighty Prince of Peace, of all earth's kingdoms conqueror, whose reign shall never cease. Sing it. His name shall be the counsel, the mighty prince of peace, of all earth's kingdoms conquer, whose reign shall never cease. Sing it. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Chorus one more time. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. The Lanes have a song this morning. God bless it. And it fits very well for this time of, of our, our situation. God help. Happy Mother's Day yes. to all the mothers here. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there listening. I thank God for my mother. And for the tremendous influence that she's had on me. I was reading this morning just a couple of things about the influence of a mother. And it, Paul, when he was in 2 Timothy, he even mentioned about Timothy's faith. But in verse 5, he says, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first, in thy grandmother, Lois, and thy mother, Eunice. They evidently had a powerful influence on Timothy. And then I read something that Charles Spurgeon wrote. If you don't mind me taking just 
just maybe two minutes at the most. Charles Spurgeon, when he got saved, he wrote a letter to his mother. And it says, he paid tribute to her for being the foremost teacher and for being the one who had so often begged God for the gift of salvation. And he wrote, your birthday will now be doubly memorable. For on the 3rd of May, the boy whom you have so often prayed, the boy of hopes and fears, your firstborn, will join the visible church of the redeemed on earth and will bind himself doubly to the Lord his God by open profession you, my mother, have been the great means to God's hand for rendering me what I hope I am. Your kind, warning, Sabbath evening addresses were too deeply settled on my heart to be forgotten. You, by God's blessing, prepared the way for the preached word and for that holy book, The Rise and the Progress. I have any courage if I feel prepared to follow my Savior, not only into the water, but should he call me even into the fire. I love you as the preacher to my heart of such courage as my praying, watching mother. So I'm thankful for my mother this morning, for every prayer that she prayed for me. And I'm thankful to be able to pass that down to my kids and talk to them about trusting God. And that's something I learned from my mother, no matter what you're going through, whatever you're fearful about, you can take that to the Lord in prayer. And so this song, you know it, <clears throat> sing it with us if you want to. I've had many tears and sorrows. I've had questions for tomorrow. There have been times I didn't know right from wrong. But in every situation, God gave blessed consolation that my trials come to only make me strong. Through it all. Trust in God through it all, through it all. I've learned to depend upon His Word. So I thank God for the mountains and I thank Him for the valleys I thank him for the storms he's brought me through for if I never had a problem I wouldn't know that he could solve them I wouldn't know what faith in God can do so I tell you through it all, oh, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus, I've learned to trust in God.
the quartet to come and sing this time. God bless them.
This world were laid at my doorstep, its treasures were mine all to use. I'd feel no regret for this way that I've taken. There's too much to gain to lose. Too many sunsets lie behind the mountain. Too many rivers my feet have walked. Well, thank you, singers. It was good to hear your voices again. It was good to hear the songs of Zion. If you have your Bible, would you turn to 1 Samuel, the first chapter, and we're going to read the first 11 verses. 1 Samuel, the first chapter, and we'll verse, read the first 11 verses. We're not going to read the entire first verse. You'll know in a moment. Now there was a certain man of Ramatha in Zaphon of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, verse 2. And he had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. And this man went up out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts, in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priest of the Lord, were there. And when the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and her daughters portions. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, a double portion. For he loved Hannah, but the Lord had shut up her womb. And her adversary also provoked her sore for to make her fret, because the Lord had shut up her womb. And as he did so year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her, therefore she wept and did not eat. 
Every year that they went up to the house of God, Penina began to relentlessly provoke Hannah. And the Bible said Hannah wept and she was so distraught she couldn't eat. Then said Elkanah, her husband, to her, Hannah, why weepest thou? And why eatest thou not? And why is thy heart grieved? Am I not better to thee than ten sons? So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by a post of the temple of the Lord. And she, Hannah, was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou will indeed look on the affliction of thy handmaid and remember me and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thy handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. Here's a woman who desperately wanted to have children. Do anything to have children. And she went to the Lord under all the stress, all the pressure, brought that little broken heart of hers to the Lord and said, Lord, if you'll just look upon your handmaid with favor, if you'll just give me a man child, I'll turn right around and give him back to you for the rest of his life. Make a note of that. Here was a woman who was about to be a mother and she made a sacrifice that was huge. She was willing to give up for God the thing that she loved the most. A child. One of Billy Graham's favorite stories is of the husband who was not very attentive to his wife. He was rather insensitive. He was always busy with his career, with his friends, with his meetings. But one day he fell under conviction and he was overwhelmed about his behavior and feeling very guilty. So he decided to change that. So on his way home from work one day, he bought a box of Rover stuff, Stover, Rover, Russell, Stover, Turnover, Rover, Russell, Stover. <laughs> yeah. But either way, it was all right. It was a box of candy and flowers to surprise his wife. He walked up to the door. He rings the doorbell. She opens the door and there he stands with the candy in one hand and the flowers in the other, singing, I love you truly, dear. Instantly, she starts crying. She breaks out in crocodile tears. They're gushing down her cheeks. She sobs, oh, Harry, everything went wrong today. The plumbing leaked all over the kitchen. The kids were terrible. The, the house is wrecked. And now you come home drunk. How many agree with me, it's not easy being a wife and a mother today. The pressures are overwhelming, keeping the kids out of trouble, guiding them through all the pitfalls of their life, preparing them to find their way in a world like ours is not easy. And to all of you mothers who have been so faithful, been so diligent through the battle. And those of you that are still in the battle, I want to say on behalf of all the children, thank you and God bless you for every sacrifice that you made, for every tear that you shed, for every sleepless night you went through worrying about your children and the many prayers that you prayed for your sons and daughters. You are, you mothers in America, 
You are the real heroes behind the success of America and the lives of your children. Can you imagine? People ask all the time. There's so many problems. Our world is falling apart. There's problems from the top all the way down to the bottom. What can we do? The one thing that could turn it all around is if America had more godly mothers. If America had mothers that knew how to raise their children, raise them up in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. Our kids wouldn't grow up to be wild and crazy and demonic. Mothers, they can make the difference. It's true that no nation is ever greater than its mothers, for they are the makers, the developers of the upcoming generations. As we approach our text, we see in the last chapter of Judges, 20, uh, chapter 21, verse 25, the nation of Israel is torn apart. Their leadership has failed. And, and you'll notice in the text that when they went up to worship the Lord in verse 3, and this, this caught my attention, and this man went up out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh, and the two sons of Eli, this was the, the priest, the high priest, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. Those two sons were demonic. They were as evil as evil sons could be. And Eli, the father, was letting them get away with murder. When the people brought their sacrifices, brought their meat offerings, there was only one church. The place was so desolate, so secularized. Israel was backslidden. But when they went up, the whole family, Penina and Hannah and the kids and Elkanah, when they went up, the Bible makes a little note. Hophni and Phinehas were there. If you read the next chapter, it says uh, that they were the children of Belial. That they didn't know the Lord. They weren't worthy. They were worthless. But when they want, went to church with the problems and the difficulties that they were having, uh, Elkanah and his family, the last thing they needed is to go into a church and find devils in there. That's how bad the situation was. And those guys turned the temple into a playboy mansion. They assaulted the women right on the steps of the church. And when the people, they came from all over and they put them a year apart. And the people came from all over and they brought their meat offerings and, and, and they brought them to the priest and, 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 and they put them in the cauldron. They, they put them in a pot. They put them in a bowl. The sons came along, the priests, Hophni and Peneus. And they had a hook, but it wasn't just one hook. It was a gang hook. And they put their hook into the pot of all the offerings and everything they pulled out, which was much more than they needed, they kept the meat offering. They robbed the meat offering. How many of you know we got robbers in our churches today? And we've got families who have all kinds of problems and they're bringing their families, they're bringing their troubles, they're bringing their burdens to the Lord. They need help and they go to the church of God and the church, the temple. And these two devils are still ministering. I want to give you a little background. I want you to see that this home was a melting pot. 
You had opposition there. Hatred was there. Jealousy was there. All kinds of problems were there. And then all of a sudden, Hannah steps into the picture. A godly woman. A godly wife to be. A wife that was barren and desperate to have children. But she is caught in the web of a cultural and domestic chaos. And at this moment, she's unaware that God has a special purpose. A special plan for her. And that is to bring back the spiritual integrity and hope of a fallen nation. Oh, if we have one prayer today for, for, for Mother's Day, it would, be, it would be that our mothers would become godly. And many of them are, and we thank God for those that are, but we need more. And what a prayer to pray, oh God, bring us back godly mothers so the integrity, so that the nation will begin to live again and love again and more than that, worship God again. And it's going to begin with a mother changing the integrity and bringing hope to a nation is going to change with a mother. And for any mother under the sound of my voice who is presently struggling or may have failed here and there along the way and the kids are breaking your heart, Hannah has a message. Hannah has a message for Mother's Day and for all mothers in any nation. God didn't bring any of us into the world to be losers. No matter how many your life may be or how messy your life may be. And that goes for everybody. We all matter immensely to God. Samuel tells us that Hannah was in a slippery place. Temptations and troubles dogged her for years. But she dodged amazingly all the fiery darts. She kept her soul clean. She maintained her spiritual integrity. And she did it because she made good choices. This Henderson man that I mentioned to you before the service, his daughter, she was 26 years old. She just went through a divorce. And she made the choice to find another boyfriend. Young people, that's going to be one of the biggest choices you'll ever make in your life. Be careful who you choose as a prospective mate for your life. Don't go out there and just choose anybody who, who fits all the description of the world. Find somebody who loves God. Find somebody that's got his head on straight. And so she brought this guy into the home. He beat her up two, three times. And then he promised how oh, I'll never do it again. And he drove her out to her farm, his farm. And I don't know what happened, but he blew her brains out with a shotgun. You see, this is the point. All you young people listening, live stream in here. Be very careful when it comes to choosing a mate. The two biggest decisions you're going to make in your life and you don't want to blow them. And that is getting saved and finding a husband. You know, my wife and I did the other day. We were so bored out of our minds. 
We went and we picked up our meals. And we thought, well, let's just go park in the front of Walmart right up close and just watch the parade. No offense, comrade. <laughs> and our eyes saw things they shouldn't have never seen. And all of a sudden, we started to lose our appetites. That's how we spent our vacation. <laughs> but I'm saying this, and do you know, Denny, you can verify this, one of the, the quickest selling items was hair dye. I saw more people at the same time, on the same head, red, white, and yellow hair. We saw things we should have never seen. America is seeing things they should never see. Our kids are growing up seeing things they should never see in public or through the medias. And that's where godly mothers come in and shut it all down. Because it's your responsibility, mom. And I know that every one of you listening to my voice takes it seriously. But here she is, caught in the web of cultural and domestic chaos. And the reformation and bringing back the spiritual integrity is going to begin with a little barren wife who becomes a mother and God uses her to turn Israel around. Samuel tells us that Hannah was in a slippery place because temptations dogged her, all kinds of trouble. And we are quickly introduced to the first sign of trouble in verse 2. It says, there was a man from Mount Ephraim, his name was Elkanah, and he had two wives, Hannah and Panina. Help us, Jesus. Polygamy wasn't allowed. Jesus gave the, God gave the rule, one man, one wife for life. And somehow some of the patriarchs, for whatever reasons, they violated that. Every godly mother is going to encounter problems. Nobody is exempt. That's what I like about the Bible. It's full of real people and real problems. And we don't have to look at some of the stalwarts and some of the prophets and some of the apostles and some of the evangelists and say to ourselves, oh my, I'll never be like that. I'll never be that great. The Bible shows us the human side of all of us. People with real problems, just like the rest of us. But their faith in God brought them through victoriously. And so can all of us if we learn to make good, godly choices. There are no limitations with God. Here Hannah is married to a good man who loves God and finds herself in a storm because her husband married another woman. And the reason that he married another woman was apparently his virility, his manhood, his masculinity was being challenged. And so he brings another woman into the equation. All the ingredients for trouble, bitterness, unforgiveness, and jealousy, and lots of fireworks is about to erupt. And the question comes up, is Hannah going to survive? 
What caused Hannah to survive in such a malfunctioned home? What caused her to survive in a home where there was hatred and jealousy and all kinds of conniving and all kinds of scheming? The happy home was turning into a nightmare. And the plot thickens as the family makes preparation to make their yearly trip to worship God. At that time that Elkanah was living, there was but one temple. For all the worshipers, secularism had just about taken over a backslidden Israel. Have you ever read about the nations in Europe? Asia? Very few churches anymore. They turned the churches into theaters. When you can no longer see, drive around and see churches in our community, you've got to know trouble is on your doorstep. Secularism. Have you ever considered the blessing of being born in a country where there are so many places of public worship? You can go to Utica, you can go to Zanesville, you can go to Columbus, you can go to Heath, you can go to Hebron. There's churches. There are houses of God there. Places which have the honorable and blessed name, house of God. Churches where Christians can assemble. But look at Elkanah and his family who have to take a long journey once a year for privilege and worshiping God publicly. What does it say to us who have God's house standing open for us to come in and worship him? We have houses of God almost at our doorsteps. There's no distance to have to drive for most. And yet some think it too much trouble to get there. God help us. And God help our mothers to help their children to never forsake the assembling of themselves together. And so much more as we see the day approaching. Look at verse 4 and 5. What do we see? Look at it. And when the time was... That Elkanah offered, he gave to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons, all her daughters, portions. But unto Hannah, he gave Hannah a double portion. Guess who saw that move? Penina. And what do we see? Hannah has Elkanah's heart. But Penina has Elkanah's children. And the green eyes got greener. Both women are under a lot of temptation. Hannah is a godly woman and, she's going, and, and the question is, is she going to cave in? To all the bitterness towards Penina. And Penina now knows in her heart that Elkanah loves Hannah. She's saying to herself, Why didn't my kids, why didn't I get a double portion? You see, it don't take much to light dynamite. <laughs> hey, brethren. Thank God for good wives. Well, there's only two of us, three of us that have good wives. Uh, let me ask you again. Thank God for good wives. <clears throat> and thank God for good husbands. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
You know what we learn and what Samuel shows us quickly? We learn that Penina is a devil. She's rude and crude. And she's relentless in her attacks upon Hannah, who is already in deep bitterness of soul because she's unable to bear children. She, always feel, she, she already feels less than. Penina has succumbed to jealousy and hatred for Hannah. And in so doing, has allowed Satan to enter into her heart. And look at Hannah. She can't help that she's barren. She can't help that she's handicapped. She's afflicted. And that she's the victim of polygamy. She's down and out. And Panina is still kicking her. While she's down. In verse 6, Penina torments Hannah every chance she gets. She belittles her for being unable to bear children. She's vindictive and she enjoys making life miserable for Hannah. Even her name, Penina, it sounds slimy. Nina. Nina rhymes with Mina. And can you imagine the venom and the hatred that Panina is going to inject into all her children and tell lies about Hannah? These poor couples that go through divorces and these poor kids that are caught in the whiplash and then they remarry or whatever and all hell breaks loose. Hatred is everywhere. And our kids grow up. Over half the kids in our country are growing up in that kind of an environment. It's no wonder they're messed up. Thank God again for the mothers of the Church of God of Licking County. So watch this now. Here's Hannah who desperately wants to have a child. Her affliction is breaking her heart. And she's extremely unhappy with wifey number two, Penina. And she's in bitterness of soul. What is she going to do? Is she going to, is she going to sink the love boat? The happy home? Is she going to sabotage the household? Is she going to ask for a divorce? Is she going to make life Hades for everybody? What's the Bible teaching us? Family is difficult. Family at times can be very difficult. I can handle family if I didn't have any people in it. Amen? Where do you bring a broken heart? Where do you bring your afflictions, your heartaches, your handicaps, your troubles? Where do you bring your anger, your pain, your hurt? And just as I finished writing that, the song came to my mind. I wish I could sing it. Living below in this old sinful world, hardly a comfort can afford. Striving alone to face temptation, where could I go? Oh, where could I go? Living below in this old sinful world, hardly a comfort to bear. Seeking a refuge for my soul, needing a friend to save me in the end. Oh, where could I go? Oh, where could I go but to the Lord? That was the only right option left for Hannah. 
and she made the right choice. In verse 10, she went up into the church house and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. Hannah poured her heart out before the Lord. Mothers who are going through some tough times, don't give up on yourself. Don't give up on your children. Don't give up on your family. You may be the only hope and the only light and the only chance that they have. Hannah was not a quitter. Although her situation looked impossible, although she was going through multiple temptations, she kept on making good choices. She kept on worshiping God. She kept on praying. She kept on trusting. She kept on believing God. What happens with most people when they go through trouble? What happens when we go through the, the ringer? What's the first thing a lot of Christians do? They quit praying. They quit loving. They quit worshiping. They quit tithing. But Hannah... There's something about that, that woman. She knew that God's way was the best way. Hannah was a gold star mother. And do you know what the Bible says about people like her? People who don't quit, people who don't give up, who don't abandon their post who try to get along with everybody. You know what the Bible says? Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. How many of you are in church right now? Because your mother, your father, a spouse, a grandparent, didn't give up when the going got tough. Hannah could have easily walked out on all the madness and drama in her home. She didn't need to sit there and let Panina keep digging at her. And you'll read the scripture. Every time they went up to the house of God, year after year after year, Panina was needling her, insulting her, belittling her, calling her less than a woman. Always reminding her. Penina always reminding Hannah. She was less than a woman. Because she couldn't bear children. Now look at her dilemma. She was going through the childless. Anguish. Her pastor Eli. Was a bad father who let his sons turn the house of God into a house, a den of thieves. 1 Samuel 2.12 says, I already quoted, Eli's sons were base and they were worthless and sons of Belial, they knew not the Lord. And they were robbing the meat offerings of the worshipers day in and day out. Then when Hannah was pouring her heart out before the Lord, while she was in the temple, her pastor, Eli, in verse 13, 14, rebuked her for being drunk. The man didn't know the difference between fervent prayer and drunkenness. And he jumped all over her. Called her a drunkard. You need to change your ways. He didn't even know what was happening. And here is a man that's trying to discipline and criticize a godly woman and his sons are in his backyard worshiping with him in the same church laying with women and robbing the offerings he's got nerve don't he and let me tell you something they all died 
on the same day. Year after year, Hannah puts up with all this hate, all this pain. And the point I want to make, I'm going to close shortly, is oh how easy in an environment like this, in a world where iniquity is abounding, oh how easy she could have said, I'm out of here. I quit. This family is crazy. But instead she calls upon the Lord and he turns the madhouse into a glad house. Hannah shows us how to stand up under constant ridicule without giving up, without abandoning God, and without hurting others. You know what I have seen too often in 30, 45 years of ministry? It's always too soon to give up. It's always too soon to walk away from God. And if ever there was a time not to walk away from God and not to give up, it's in this day and age when it looks like the judgment is at the door. This is not the time to give up. This is not the time to walk away. This is the time for us to get as close to God as we can. What's the last sermon I preached? You remember the last sermon I preached before we went into the quarantine? I was walking up this aisle and I said, hey, now everybody go out and look for some trouble. We're going to get in some trouble. And man, we got into trouble. 33, 35 million people unemployed. Everything that we gained in three years. We had the best economy in all the years of the presidents. And there was more to it than a virus. There were thieves in the background. And even though America got knocked down, there's enough godly mothers where she's going to get back up on her feet. And how many can see that God is rocking the boat? God's trying to get America the last good nation to stand. Trying to get Americans to wake up. Judgment is at the door. Giving up our hopes and dreams too soon. Giving up our gifts and callings too soon. What if Hannah, because of all the struggle and all the aggravation with Penina in her life, what if she had given up too soon? She would have missed the blessings of a lifetime. God gave her a son and he became a prophet who brought peace and stability back to Israel. And after that, God gave her four times, five times as much. She had five more children after Samuel. She had three sons and two daughters. Do you know why? Because when she said, and I vow a vow, if you will, will, will give me a man child, I'll give him right back to you. God turned around and said, I'll give you six more. You can't beat God given. She would have missed the blessings of a lifetime. Many of us are too near the end to give up now. Too near the end to let a panina cause you to give up and walk away from our dream worlds. Sherm will tell you, I talk to him every once in a while, cut my hair, we see him in a restaurant. I said, Sherm, it's been a good ride. You're 81, I'm gonna be 76. Not many more days beyond the sunset, but it's been a good ride. 
and the ride is about to get better. Effie texted me yesterday. I forgot, I, I forgot to mention it in a prayer request. Her granddaughter, her daughter or somebody's her granddaughter, she had this tumor in her brain and they removed it. And it came back like a vengeance. And the doctors called them in and said, she's got two days to two weeks left. That little girl's name is Tiffany. And I sent a text back to Tiffany. And I said, Tiffany, You hold on as tightly as you can now to Jesus. And he'll hold you even tighter. You are about to transition. The end has not come. Just the beginning has come. And you're going to wake up in a world... Where there are no more more tumors, no more death, no more separation from your loved ones, no more being sick. You just hold on, and God will give you the grace to walk through the curtain. And you're not going to die. All you're going to do is change worlds. Like Hannah, every mother has a weapon. We don't see the weapon come into play till the next year and they start going up to worship God. But every mother has a weapon. Are you discouraged? Are you defeated? Are you worried about your family, your future, or even your own life? Don't let the pinheads of this world get the best of you. But you can't fight fire with fire. You can't fight dirty. Oh, how tempted Hannah must have been to want to just knock Penina's head off. Put worms in her cereal. But you can't fight dirty. And the only weapon that struggling mothers have and struggling everybody the only weapon that we have in times when, when injustice is everywhere is prayer. And man, did Hannah knock it out of the park. God, you give me a man child and I'll turn around and give them back to you all the days of his life. You see, and uh, Samuel was three years old when Hannah brought him to the temple. You didn't have to bring him to the temple until he was 20. And he stayed there for 30 years until he was 50. But Hannah brought him to the temple, gave him back to the Lord 17 years early. Can you imagine? You mothers can imagine. She brings her son. And she puts the son in the hands of Samuel, of of Eli. And she has to walk away from a three-year-old son. And she's not going to see him again for another year. 
It must have tore her up. And then I got to thinking. You know that little son they had called Samuel? Elkanah got real fond of him. Oh, I love little Sammy. I love little Sammy. And Hannah was saying, yeah, you love little Sammy, but you also love Pinhead. Now, I'm going to get even with you, Samuel. I mean, uh, 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 Sam, yeah, I'm going to get even, even with you, Elkanah. Just about the time your heart's all wrapped around little Samuel, I'm going to give him to the priest for the rest of his life and see how you feel not having a boy. Boy, don't mess around with men. With, excuse me, don't mess around with, with women, with mothers. They know how to get even. That was the Italian translation. Thank God for mothers. Sherm, get a song. I'm ready. Sister Brenda, you can come. I think of all mothers who give their best. Raise some of us without fathers. In humble dwellings. Waited in the cold for the bus. Through the cold winter mornings. Drove 20 miles to work. Worked long hours, struggled to pay bills, and to put food on the table. We have no idea the kind of burdens that mothers carry and the years that they carry them. We don't know how many tears they shed, how many sacrifices they made to keep us happy and to keep us safe and to keep us fed. Discouragement never drove them off. Unpaid bills never drove them off. Sacrifices never drove them off. Worries and doubts and fears haunted them, but never drove them off. And for that, we, the children, we love our parents. We love our mothers. And I close with this. Remember, Hannah made a great discovery in the midst of her surrender to God. She realized that children are not just for parents. They're for God too. And she said, you give me a child and I'll give them back to you. Hannah had to overcome her share of struggles, both from within the home and without. How did she survive? She was a mother of faith. She knew how to pray. She knew how to make the right choices. And they know how to stay surrendered to the Lord. It's one, of, it's one thing to dedicate our children to the Lord. It's one thing to impress upon them the priority of serving the Lord. But Hannah was committed to the Lord to do whatever it took for little Samuel to reach his godly potential. Godly mothers and fathers, thank God for you. But our job, parents, is to establish the priority. Now listen closely, I'm gonna close with this thought. The priority of our parenting is to establish the priority of the things of God in the lives of our children. Nothing should be more important than the priority of God. If your children see anything, they ought to see God. They ought to see God in you. But unfortunately today, our children in many homes have been deceived
by our media culture concerning what is important and what deserves our allegiance. You go out there in this crazy backward world, what's important to them is nothing compared to the priority of the things of God. What's important to them is this and that, looking like this, dressing like that, going after this, going after that. The world makes it all look wonderful. But it's the greatest deception. Because all that the world can show you is what's temporal, what's short-lived, what's only going to last for a short while until you tear your mind up, tear your life up. Hannah did not contribute to the problem of encouraging commitment to the wrong things. She said in verse 11, Lord, if you give me a man child, I will give him unto you all the days of his life. The most important thing for my little boy is that he knows you. Are we doing the right thing by encouraging our kids to get involved in all the worldly and secular attractions regardless of their interference with church functions and the things of God? How many parents have took the bait and all they're interested in is their kids and going here and going there and doing this and doing that and shining in the world. But it's something that shines for a moment. But Hannah was important. What was important to her was that her child would serve the Lord all the days of his life. What are parents doing today? They got their kids scheduled and so overbooked, they don't even have a moment for the things of God. What a tragedy. And the only thing that can turn that around are godly mothers. Thank God for them. In a post-Christian society like we're in today, more than ever, our prayers and our godly lives will make the difference in their lives. I want to say, if as a parent you have fallen short here or there, stumbled a little, it's not too late to bring your burden to the Lord. It's not too late to see God turn things around. It doesn't take God long to turn things around. You just got to come to the place where there's bitterness of soul. Come to the place where you realize the only hope is the Lord. And what a sacrifice she made. Give me a child. And he's yours for the rest of his life. When God saw that, he stepped in and turned the situation around in a year. Glory be to God. Amen. If you're here and you're carrying a load and you're starting to see that things out there are, are getting real dicey. We're seeing things we never thought we'd see. Corruption being exposed at the highest levels. We're seeing kids, teenagers, fathers, being eaten up alive by the culture. And we're raising all kinds of cain because 30,000 Americans have died when a month and a half ago, 200,000 babies were murdered.
Nobody's doing anything about that much. We got, get all worked up over this and that. And our kids are dying by the thousands because of drugs, because of alcohol, because of this, because of that. And all we can do is focus. And I'm not minimizing it. But look at the nations that never even closed down. And, they, and they're getting along fine and they didn't destroy their economies, what little they had. And all they have to do is, is run a little test, incite us with a little panic, a little fear. And we start getting in line like little chickens. What do you want me to do? We've got a right to be here worshiping God. It's our First Amendment constitutional right. And thank God for those who are pushing back and not letting them bring socialism and communism and all that stupidity. Thank God. God, give us some mothers. Give us some fathers. And give us some folks and give us a church in this country that knows how to stand. And having done all to stand, stand therefore. Amen. If you need to pray, have a little talk with Jesus, this would be a good time to do it. Go ahead, Brother Sherman. Thanks for listening. God bless you. Would you stand, please? Sing with me. Living below in the soul simple. That's it. Hardly a comfort can afford. Striving alone Where's to that? face. Where's the, where's the basket? Where could I go? She's coming, Donna, right here. Donna, she's coming right here. Give me the basket. Where could I go? Where could I go? Seeking a refuge for my soul. Seeking a friend. Yes. To help me in the end. Where could I go but to the Lord? What a great song. Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. Those of you that joined us live stream, Every year we give out four gift cards to our mothers. And I'd say mothers, those of you that are here, you got a 75% chance of winning. Madison, Bree, you pick out one Bree. Madison, you pick out one. All right, Madison, who is it? Anita Lane. Anita Lane, okay. Bree, Monica who? Lane. Monica Lane. <laughs> now, wait a minute. The fix is in. <laughs> Something not right. <laughs> Hoffney and Phineas, huh? All right, comrade, maybe you can do better. Don't pick out a Valentina, we're throwing you out. <laughs> Evelyn Romine, the song leader. Oh. Aaron? 
Pick a winner. Wilma Gray? Ah, she's not here. Pick another one. <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> okay. There's no church tonight for the lanes. Monica, Anita, God bless you, wonderful mothers. God bless you, wonderful mother. And Gray? Um... Jeff, would you give this to Gray, Sister Gray? Good to see each and every one of you. We're only going to be having church Sunday morning, probably through the end of the month. And then on the 31st, which is the last Sunday of this month, Brother Holly is going to be here. And we're going to have a revival Sunday morning. We'll have a meal following the service. Sunday night and Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday night, Brother Holly will be with us. We need a revival. I'm just trying to get caught up a little from missing all the church that we've missed. I was actually missing you guys. You weren't missing me? Oh, you were. <laughs> 